Bueno, muchas gracias a todos que han llegado. Nosotros estamos por comenzar esta próxima sesión de Rayo contra Cáncer. Esta sesión será dado por Dr. Indrin Shetty de uh, Henry Ford Clinic. Él nos va a dar este discurso que está titulado de Considerations, SBRT, SRS and SBRT, safe, Safety Planning and Imaging Delivery. Esta sesión vamos a también tener después unas preguntas de, de los topics, de, de los temas que hemos pasado para revisar la información. <clears throat> okay, so we have Dr. Che with us here today and he will be giving us this lecture today. And afterwards, we will also be covering a few questions that have been submitted so we can go over previous knowledge. So with that, I'd like to pass the time over Dr. Chetty. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Michael. It's my pleasure to present to you all today. The title of this talk is Technical Considerations, SRS, SBRT Safety Planning, and Image-Guided Delivery. So let's begin with a, if you like, a definition of what stereotactic radiosurgery means. This techniques was one of the earliest types of treatments that was offered, started back in the 50s. Stereotactic describes a procedure which a target lesion is localized relative to a known three-dimensional reference frame system. And so SRS and stereotactic body radiotherapy, or it's also known as stereotactic ablative radiotherapy or SABR, are delivered using very high radiation doses. Generally, it's greater than 10 gray refraction for brain tumors, certain brain tumors, you can be up to 90 gray. In some cases for functional indications, 130 gray in a single fraction. Um, SBRT is typically delivered over a short course of treatment, generally less than five fractions. SRS is typically defined as treatment to the brain or spine, while SBRT is defined as treatment elsewhere in the body, right? Extracranial or outside the CNS. So why is this technology important? Well, it's being used a lot in our field. And this is some data from, it's fairly old data now, and uh, it's about nine or 10 years old. But this is a survey of SBRT utilization from 1,600 radiation oncologists. They, they got uh, greater than 500 responses. And if you look at the table here, you can see an uh, exponential increase in the utilization. So 2005 is about 20%, 2010 is 65%. If you extrapolate to where we are now, it's closer to like 90%, which you can see you know, in almost every treatment indication, use of hypofractionated radiation therapy. It's becoming very popular in the United States. There are clinical trial results uh, supporting it and ASTRO get guidelines. So the big organizations like ASTRO and AAPM recommending hypofractionation for many of our treatment sites as a standard of care. So if you look at the types of treatments, you know, it's, it's still probably majority early stage lung cancers. Uh, spine is quite popular at 70%, lungs 90%. Liver, pancreas, you know, on the order of 55% for liver, pancreas and adrenals and prostate less than 10%, but you see a um, significant increase over the past few years with prostate cancer also given the, the very good results, low toxicities with doses like eight gray times five fractions. So starting to see more utilization of prostate um, cancer treatment with SBRT as well. So, what is the issue? Why, why do we worry about SRS and SBRT treatment? Well, they're complex treatments. And so you have complex interactions between different factors, which confounds the ability to image and target accurately. You have a small number of fractions, and so you can't average out the uncertainty. You know, 10 years ago, we used to say, well, the patient's getting 30 or 40 fractions the uncertainties will average out. Well, if you're doing five fractions, you can't really average out uncertainties. And you're also giving a very high dose per fraction. 
So this means that you must hit the target and avoid the surrounding normal tissues, right? High dose perfraction, you really have to be able to limit how much normal tissues getting is receiving dose. So now, if you couple this with small fields, SRS 3 cm down to five millimeter, SBRT less, generally less than five cm, you realize that there's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of confounding factors in terms of the planning accuracy, image guided delivery, which really requires the highest level of quality and safety. Right, so it means that beam model, target definition, dose symmetry, dose calculation, and target lo localization must all be highly accurate. That's why we worry about these treatments and we try to pay utmost attention toward quality and safety. So the best example to show you that these things, these, these items, these activities for small field treatment are important is to share with you some of the accidents that have been reported that have involved small fields. So this is a nice paper, which is actually available online. It's, um, it's an open access paper in radiation protection dosimetry from 2008. It's titled Lessons from Recent Accidents in Radiation Therapy in France. So I'll share with you some of what, what, was, what we noted in that paper. This was an error that impacted 145 patients between in this time frame. And these patients were treated for brain tumors using a 6 MV beam with a micro MLC. And the error was due to inaccurate measurement of small field output factors. The measurement of the small field out, output factors was, do, was done using a farmer chamber, cylindrical type ion chamber with an air cavity of 0.6 cubic centimeters and a diameter of six millimeters and length of 23 millimeters. So the way this paper is structured is it talks about different events and this was one of the major events that occurred. So my hope is that when you look at this type of measurement that you're all shaking your heads thinking we would never make a small field measurement with, with a pharma type, type ion chamber. But this kind of thing has occurred in many situations. So we know that a, such a large volume ion chamber will suffer from significant volume averaging and significantly underestimate the output factor, which leads to overestimation of the monitor units. And so, you know, the, the maximum dose was over 200% different from, from the prescription dose. So the output factor should have been measured with a small volume ion chamber, and you can see the difference here, so here's the small volume ion chamber, which is in the triangles, and the circles are the chamber that they use. So if you take, for instance, let's see, if you took a field size of, say, say you know, 10 millimeters or one centimeter, then you know, one centimeter, then they would have measured point, uh, point 0.4 with this triangle. This is a large field uh, detector. The small field detector is more like point eight, right? So it's a factor of two, roughly. And factor of two high means the monitor units are different because it, 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 it goes inversely, right? So the, you know, if you use an output factor of 0.4 versus 0.8, the monitor units is twice as much. So that's the issue in that particular case. Now, if you look at even in the U.S., in, in 2009, there was a radiation error that impacted 76 patients undergoing stereotactic radiosurgery. They were overdosed by 50% after miscalibration of the new equipment. And this hap went on for five years until they had an independent physicist come and check their calibration and their actual numbers. And the specific error was related to incorrect volume ion chamber used to measure small field output factors. So same issue, the physicist used a large volume ion chamber, should have used a small volume and a big mistake occurred. So, you know, this impacted 152 patients. Now, let's look at why this is challenging. So this was a survey of 40 identical SRS Linux measuring a six millimeter by six millimeter field defined by the MLC. So they're all the same machines and they were done at different institutions in the US. And the, the question was asked to measure 
the small the, the output factor for the small field, same geometric conditions and so on. They just had to use whatever detectors or whatever equipment they had in their own center. So if you look at this, you see stunning results. You see a 45% variation in, in the measurement of these output factors under the same geometric conditions with the same machines, right? So this shows you that there's really little, very little confidence in our ability as medical physicists to measure these small field output factors, 45% variation, which would essentially mean a 45% variation in the monitor units that you're delivering to patients and can be catastrophic in terms of accidents, right? So now, so hopefully I've, I've provided you with a couple compelling examples of why small fields are very important in everything that we do and why mistakes with fall small fields can lead to big accidents with patients. And these are just a couple examples. There are many more related to small fields. So in order to get this right, we have to first understand the physics of small fields. There's a couple articles um, on this. Most recently, there's the IPEM uh, report. Well, this was probably about 10 years ago, the IPEM report, but there's um, another report Technical series, report series number 483, dosimetry of small static fields used in external beam radiotherapy, published by the IAEA and the APM, and this was published last year. And I think there are lots of good examples of this kind of thing, which are critical when you're trying to measure a small field or when you're trying to do dose calculations or image guided delivery. So if you look at the IAEA report, they define small as follows at least one of the three physical conditions will be fulfilled for an external beam to be designated as small. The first one is a loss of lateral charge particle equilibrium on the beam axis, right? Second is partial occlusion of the primary photon source by the collimating devices. And third, the size of the detector is similar or large compared to the actual beam dimensions or the field size if you're trying to to use for this um, for your measurement. So let's look at each of these, starting with the occlusion of the effective photon source. What does that mean? Well, if you stand at the location of the patient or the phantom and you look up, on the left you see that you have a relatively large field and you can see the entire source, right? There's no occlusion of the source. And now, if you look at a small field, if you're standing at the, at the patient looking up, then you don't, you aren't able to see. I think there's some background noise. If you can mute, mute your phone, that'd be great. Yep. Uh, if, you, if you look in the small field setting, you, and you look up, you'll see there's an occlusion of the small field of the source. What does that mean? You're eclipsing, you can't see the entire source. Now, if you think of the source, the entire length of the source, and you add up the fluence along the length of the source, that gives you the output of the machine, right? That's your total photon fluence. If you're only seeing part of the source, that means you're only seeing part of the fluence. So you're only seeing part of the output of the machine. And as a result, if you look at the profile here, you see a reduction in the output of the machine because you're eclipsing the source, right? So that's an important consideration for the small fields because you actually get a loss of output, absolute output of the machine. So there's been some really excellent work done with Monte Carlo simulations and the like of trying to study this effect. And in one uh, series of papers, Dr. Professor Nahum from the UK and his colleagues worked on a paper where they looked at a, they compared the full geometry, meaning the full, um, the full linear source width versus a point source. And what they did was they scored, they, they, in the calculation, they, they computed karma instead of dose. Now karma, if you recall, is the, kinetic energy released in the material, right? So it's the energy from the photon to the electron. And when you 
score karma, the electron is assumed to stop. So there's no transport of electrons. Okay, so if you score dose, you're transporting photons and electrons. If you're, if you're, if you're computing karma, you're only transporting photons. So, so what effect, what this effectively does is it takes the electron business out of the equation completely. So you're not dealing with any la lateral scattering of electrons, you're just dealing with photons. And what you see is when you use a point source, you see this kind of reduction in the output, about a 10% reduction as you go from three by three down to 0.25 centimeters. But if you look at if you look the if you look at the full geometry, you see this kind of reduction. So this is now looking at the actual source, right? The actual source of the LINAC is about two millimeters or so, right? And if you get down to about a half a cm, you see a significant reduction. So if you think about it, in one case you're dealing with a point, in the other, another case you're dealing with a linear source. What is the result of this? The result of this is occlusion of the source, because in the case with the full source, you're not seeing the entire source. And as a result, you get a significant reduction in the output, which is essentially following what I just showed you in the previous slide. Now, this impact impacts on your typical treatment planning systems. The, some work that we did comparing the AAA anis, analytic anisotropic an isotropic algorithm and Acuros in the eclipse planning system. And if you look at the, the stereotactic beam, uh, beam model uh, on the left for AAA, you see that if you change the default parameter from zero millimeters to three millimeters for the source width, you get a significant variation in the profile. So at zero millimeters, you get up to you know 35% at three millimeters, you get much more of a blurring here down at 20%. The Monte Carlo simulations are using the actual geometry of the machine, and the source width is around a millimeter and a half, and you can see that the Monte Carlo is right between one and two millimeters, right? And on the right, the same thing for the Acuros planning system. So these default parameters that they tell you to use can be quite different based on the width, different widths of the source that you have. Okay, all right, so the first question, there are three questions that I had uh, provided on this and I was requested to incorporate them into the presentation. The first question is, which of the following statements is true at field sizes less than one by one? And the answers are A, lateral photon scattering decreases, B, lateral electron scattering decreases, C, effect of photon source becomes occluded, or D, beam energy decreases. So the answer that we're looking for here is C, as we just discussed, the effect of photon source becomes occluded. Now, if you look at A and B, lateral photon scattering decreases or lateral electron scattering decreases, none of that changes because the field size doesn't determine the range of the photon or electron, right? the energy determines the range of the, of the photon or the electron. So that, that those answers don't really make sense. So C is the one that, that we're looking for. D, beam energy decreases as you get small. Actually, it's the opposite. The beam energy gets slightly harder because you've taken scatter out of the equation. So C is your answer, and I was focusing on, on the photon source occlusion. And there's a reference here that I've provided as well. Hey, Dr. Chetty? Yeah. So we, we have a, like a request for a bit of a clarification about the dosimetry and geometry, geometric effects of the penumbra. If you could explain a little bit about that. The beam penumbra? penumbra small fields, sorry. The penumbra on small fields? Yes. Yeah, I, I'll get to that. Oh, you will, okay. I, I, will, I will get to that. Yeah, I haven't talked specifically about beam penumbra, but that comes along with the lateral electron scattering effect, and I'll, I'll get more into that. Okay, thank you. Great. Sure. All right, so with regard to treatment plans and how you generate the treatment plans, you know, there are some common sense things that you can apply for SBRT treatment. First of all, use non-overlapping beams, and, and, and in some cases, non-coplanar beams might help you. This is a non 
seven field non coplanar plan. You want to use with the, the beams with the best geometry for the particular site. Avoid beams with long path length through the lung, for instance. So if you have a, a lesion that's on one side of the lung, that's on the periphery, let's say, of one, one lung, you don't necessarily want to put a lot of beams through the contralateral lung, right? Um, you want to try to be cognizant of the other normal tissues, so try to keep sightedness in mind. These are just some other examples, you know, seven field liver, seven field lung, eight field pancreas with non-coplanar beams, and eight field vertebral body for spine. What happens if you use too few beams? This was something that actually happened. This was a paper that was published in the Red Journal back in 2008 from a pretty prestigious, well-known institution in the US. And they were just starting to learn about stereotactic body radiotherapy. And in this particular example, they ended up using a few fields. I think it was maybe three fields or three beams or less. And what happened was you had a significant skin toxicity. And you see that here on this patient, right? And the point behind this was that when you use very few uh, number of beams, you don't spread out the skin dose. And as a result, you can have a significant impact, especially, for instance, if the patient is getting a, you know, a PA field and there's the couch in the way and you have a bolusing effect, you, know, you could end up with a significant complication like this. So the lesson being that you want to use as many beams as possible to spread out the skin dose. And that's a recommendation now because of instance issues like this that have occurred with SBRT treatment. What about block margin? So if you're doing a 3D treatment, for instance, in a conventional treatment plan, you put, here's your PTV, planning target volume, here's your MLC, and you have a margin between the PTV and the MLC. That's called a block margin. That's to account for the beam penumbra, right? In a typical 6MB beam, let's say, the, the, the penumbra should be around 5 to 6 millimeters. You know, here's the dose distribution. The, the fall-off is generally quite gradual, right? It's not as sharp as it would be with SBRT. And the maximum dose is usually within 10%. So it's within 100, you know, the hot spot's 110%. And you want that, right? If you're doing 3D treatment planning, you want a nice homogeneous dose distribution. Well, with SBRT, you want the opposite, okay? So what you end up doing is you want a very sharp fall-off. In order to induce a very sharp fall-off in the dose, what you do is you really close down this block margin. So you can make it zero millimeters or sometimes you can make it negative, right? Negative one or negative, you see that sometimes. But certainly you want it to be very small. And the reason for that is that you have a very sharp fall-off in the dose distribution. And what, what this does is it helps you pull the, it helps you fall off from the normal tissues. When you hit the normal tissues, the dose is falling off very rapidly. But it also creates a very large hotspot, okay, 25% or more. Why do you want a large hotspot? Well, all of the outcomes that we we're finding with SBRT are potentially due to the fact that you're giving a very high dose in the central region of the tumor, in the GTV, right? So one argument is that the hotter the dose in the GTV, the more likely you are to get a cure, to kill all the cells. And that makes sense from a radiobiologic standpoint as well, right? All right, so I'm just gonna give you a couple examples now of things uh, from RTOG 0813 and 0915, and, and you know some examples of prescription isodose coverage, high dose spillage, intermediate dose spillage. And here are some parameters and constraints for the normal lung, uh, lung, liver, esophagus, heart, spinal cord. And you know these are examples that you can take a look at from uh, the NRG, RTOG 0813, 0618, 0915, and TG 101. There are some definitions uh, from the RTOG of conformity. Uh, conformity is the ratio of prescription isodose volume to the planning volume. Um, you want this to be, if the value is greater than one, the PIV is too large, potentially overtreating. Uh, 
normal tissues. If it's less than one, it's too small, potentially under, under treating the tumor. Those are things you can certainly look at in the protocol. Another example for spine dose constraints from R2G 0631. And for, for instance, for the spinal cord, you want less than or equal to 0.35 cc, getting no more than 10 gray. And you can see other constraints here as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how this impacts on treatment planning, especially when you have small fields and you have non-homogeneity non or heterogeneity in your field. So here's an example of um, the concept of charge particle equilibrium when you have a broad photon field. If you count the number of electrons leaving this volume, it's equivalent to those entering, and you have a steady state or charge particle equilibrium. When you are now in a narrow photon field, you have more energy, more electrons leaving than entering because you have a la lack of side scatter here, right? So as a result, this is a loss of charged particle equilibrium and it can lead to reduction in the dose. If you couple this with this situation here where you have tissue heterogeneity, so this is a slab phantom, this is a 10 MV pencil beam on a slab phantom. This is, um, water, long equivalent, and then water. And you see what happens to the electron tracks when they hit the lung. They start scattering out laterally, right? So if you had a tumor in the center here, you see that the dose of the tumor would be reduced because electrons are transporting energy away, right? So if you make this analogous now to a slab phantom, here's what you see. You see the depth dose increasing as it normally would, build up region starts reducing because of attenuation. And then when it hits the lung, you have a significant drop off. This is a two by two field size. There's Monte Carlo calculations and measurements here, right? It, you see a significant drop off inside the lung because of the fact that the electrons are transporting energy away from the central axis, as I just showed you, right? So you have this reduction in dose. And then you get this sort of rebuild up of dose again when you hit the water surface on the distal interface because the electrons are starting to stop over this range, right? So if the electrons are stopping in the higher density water, you have an increase in dose over a range, right? So this dose rebuild up in the tumor resulting from underdoses. So if you take this picture and you make it analogous in a 2D version, so you see that on the right here. This is what you kind of get, okay? You have, uh, here's your, your, your water, here's your lung, and here's your tumor, right? You can think of this as a lung tumor. So when the electrons hit and it starts scattering in the lung, they take off, but then they see the tumor, which is density one, roughly, and they start stopping. So you end up with this rebuild up of dose. So this, this, this region, shaded region here, is equivalent to the yellow ring that you see here, right? Because the electrons are building up, right, over this region. Now, as that tumor size gets smaller, right, what happens is that ring stays the same, but the volume of the ring gets larger relative to the volume of the tumor. And eventually, when the tumor is really small, what we call these coin lesions, now you're not even stopping electrons in the forward direction. So you have a significant reduction of dose in this situation. And in, in this case, you really need an accurate algorithm to predict the dosimetry. So let's go to question two. Which of the following statements regarding depth dose measurements for a two by two six MV field in a water lung water phantom is true? A, the dose in the lung slab will increase because the density of the lung tissue is lower than that of water. B, the dose in the lung slab will increase because of the increased photon scattering in the lung tissue. C, the dose in the lung will decrease because the range of scattered photons increases in lung tissue. And D, the dose in the lung slab will decrease because the range of scattered electrons increases in the lung tissue. So we know that it can't increase, right? So A and B are out. C, it says the, the dose in the lung slab will decrease because the range of scattered photons increases. No, the, the, scattered, the range of the scattered photons doesn't change much in the lung at all, right? Because photons are, are 
the photon attenuation is based on electron density, and electron density is very similar between water and lung. But electrons, however, are significantly impacted. And so the range of the electron increases in the lung tissue significantly, and, and so D is the answer there. And I give you a reference as well. All right, so let's look at an example of some treatment plans. So this is an example treatment plan using a pencil beam algorithm. It's a small field, three centimeter diameter. And if you look with the pencil beam algorithm, you do a great job of covering the target at the 95% line. So you would say this is a, a, a plan that you could treat. Now, if you take the same plan and recompute it with the Monte Carlo algorithm in the same planning system, you see the issue here, significant reduction of dose. Now, only the 80% line is covering the GTV, let alone the PTV, right? You're not even close. So if you look at the DVHs, there's about a 40% difference here, especially in this um, peripheral region of the tumor. So the low dose region is 40% lower. Um, and if you look at the normal lung, you see the, the Monte Carlo predicts a greater low dose spread in the normal lung. So you have an increase in the dose in the normal lung in the in this lower volume region. So there's uh, you know many many papers about this. There's one that we published in the Green Journal showing comparisons between dose calculation algorithms, different algorithms. And what we found was that the Monte Carlo collapsed cone convolution AAA all were in agreement, whereas the 1D pencil beam and the 3D pencil beam were very far off. So you wouldn't recommend using those algorithms. And here you see some DVHs. This was a 48 gray regimen, 12 gray times four fractions. And you clearly see that on this scale that the AAA collapsed cone convolution, Acuros, and Monte Carlo are all generally in agreement. 3D and 1D pencil beam algorithms are way off. All right, so let's turn, switch gears now and talk about image guidance and some of the types of technologies that exist. You know, assuming you have good algorithms, you've been able to plan this case well, now you have to deliver it, right? And- Dr. Chetty, um, yeah. one question. Uh, uh -huh. Someone's asked, so basically, is Monte Carlo the best algorithm for SRS and SBRT? No, I, so in, from the publications that are out there now, and including some of ours, we found that, that the Collapse cone convolution algorithms or the superposition convolution algorithms are equivalent, are, are pretty good, uh, as well as the Acuros algorithm, which is like a discrete ordinance, is sort of like a Monte Carlo type algorithm. Those, so if I were to summarize it, I would say collapsed, uh, I would say superposition convolution algorithms like collapse cone convolution, like AAA. Uh, or Acuros, which is not, which is a different type of algorithm, or Monte Carlo are fairly equivalent for most cases. There are a few cases where you have very small lesions that are peripherally located in lung, where you may need something like Monte Carlo. But for the majority of the cases, these other algorithms are quite accurate. Okay, thank you. Sure. So, so let's review some of the technologies for image guidance. And there are machines, mistakes that, happens, that happen with machines as well. And this is another example from the paper that I talked about earlier from lessons and uh, accidents in France. And this was an example for a patient treated for an AVM with a, uh, with a 6MV, so it's a single fraction with a cone collimator. And what happened here was that the backup collimators needed to block the radiation outside the cone system should have been set to 40 millimeters, right? Instead, they were set to 40 centimeters, okay? So what happened was that all the radiation between the four millimeters that you're supposed to set it to and the four centimeters was basically irradiating the patient, right? And this obviously can be a very debilitating thing. Patients can die and so on. Now, there was a very similar incident that occurred in the U.S. that was published in the New York Times article, articles back in 2011. And this was very, very similar in the sense that on the left here, you see how this is supposed to work. You're supposed to set the backup jaws to block 
the extraneous radiation. But if your backup drawers are too large, then you end up with radiation outside your collimator. And this was a clinic where the, the main physicist that was supposed to be or that planned the case wasn't available. There was a second physicist there, and the therapist called the physicist and said, hey, you know, I'm getting an override. Well, I need to override the jaw setting. What do I set it to? And the physicist said 10 by 10. Well, they, they were implying 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters. The therapist thought centimeters and set it to 10 centimeters. Okay, so you can see a very similar kind of thing. In this particular case, the patient passed away. So, you know, these are real consequences. So it's really important that all of these safety checks are in place when you're doing these types of treatments. So anyway, let's talk about image guidance on the treatment machine now. And I'm showing you a picture now of the different types of image guided technologies you have. You have a conventional ITV based approach, a gating approach where you turn the radiation on when the tumor is in the window, your breath hold approach, and a tracking approach where you actually track the tumor. Okay, and I'll give you some examples of each. Starting with this um, localization, volumetric localization, where here's your tumor, and this is just two examples of motion envelopes that you could see at the time of simulation, right? So there are two examples here showing different cases. Okay, here's a motion envelope here, here's what it looks like here. If you go to the treatment unit, you sometimes get this kind of effect where your motion envelope is systematically off shift. This is called a baseline shift. And how do you monitor a baseline shift? Well, volumetric imaging really is very helpful. And I think that this sort of changed the paradigm. The invention of comb beam CT, David Jaffrey's patent in 2005, getting volumetric imaging where you can see the target, see the normal tissues, has really improved our ability to hit the target much more accurately. And so you see an example of that, how you would correct. So you see simulation in the solid line and then treatment in the dash line. And you can see if there's a shift, you can account for that in three dimensions by looking at the tumor and the normal tissue, right? So with regard to planning margins, we found that SBRT or use of daily comb beam CT has really helped us with regard to margins. If you just set up the patient based on skin tattoos here, the margins, they're greater than one centimeter or 10 millimeters in all directions for different, for different locations of tumors. But if you use comb beam CT daily, then you see the margins are down to three to four millimeters in all directions for all these different tumor locations. What about 4D comb beam CT versus 3D comb beam CT? That's a useful technique in some instances. This is what a 3D comb beam CT would look like. If you look at a 4D comb beam CT at peak inhale, you see it's quite different from the 3D, right? If you look now at the 4D comb beam CT at exhale, you can see it's similar, and this makes sense. The 3D comb beam CT is generally averaged out over the exhale phase where 70% of the breathing cycle occurs. So you can see a better correspondence. But 4D comb beam CT allows you the ability to be able to see the tumor at different phases of breathing. So with regard to volumetric imaging, it's available to correct for systematic uncertainties. One is able to view normal tissues. Imaging information is considered st static and not dynamic in the 3D context. So you can't always account for real-time motion. Treatment imaging of the ITV may result in unwanted dose to the normal tissues, especially for high amplitude motion. So if you, have, if you have a lot of motion, you can give more normal tissue dose, which sometimes is not something that you necessarily desire. And the alignment of this CBCT to reference planning data set can be a little tricky. It's not clear which data set you should be aligning to. Average tends to be quite useful in the clinics versus free breathing and 4D comb CT might be helpful. Image noise and artifacts can confound proper visualization, especially if you have a large amount of scatter in your image. Like if you're doing pelvis imaging, you can get a fair amount of scatter in the image, which can degrade your image quality. All right, so let's look at a couple other technologies. Active breathing control, ABC was used to, was found to reduce margins by half or more for a liver or lung lesion. Interfraction reproducibility was good. Interfraction reproducibility can, could be problematic 
you know, was found to be up to nine millimeters. So you have to be careful with that. But the the one caveat with, with ABC is that it increases treatment factor time by three to five because patients often have a hard time tolerating it. You have to go in the room and so on multiple times. So that can increase treatment time. There are other alternatives, including gating using external surrogates. And this is the, like the RPM, the block marker, where you're trying to correlate internal and external motion. So here's an example of marker position, diaphragm position. You see this, that there's a phase shift, a phase offset that you have to be able to account for. There are other technologies like the RT, RT system out of the folks in Japan, where they use x-ray tubes and in image intensifiers to image the patient in real time. The one issue with this is that the skin dose can be quite high because it's like you're giving floral imaging for the whole procedure, right? The, another technology, the brain lab system, where you're using optical guidance and interfraction imaging at the same time. The uh, one caveat here is that you're using these stereoscopic x-rays. Again, they're planar x-rays, so they're not volumetric images. So you have to worry sometimes about uh, what the information planar versus volumetric imaging can provide. But you can also do tracking with this system, and it's been shown to be fairly reliable for, for tracking as well, gating. There's the cyber, cyber knife technology, which uses an MV Linac, the cyber knife, the robot, right? So it uses, it, it, it generates a model that helps you correlate the external and internal anatomy. Again, with models, they're surrogates of tumor motion, so you have to be able to account for some uncertainties in your, in your margins, your planning margins. There's the tracking, tumor tracking moving MLC system, which was published um, some time ago and is actually being used in Australia now in clinical trials and maybe even in the US, I think there are ongoing clinical trials looking at actual use of the MLC, moving the MLC based on the Calypso electromagnetic transponders, right? So the transponders are implanted in the tumor, and as the tumor moves, the MLC moves to keep up with the tumor. There are other technologies that, that you know, we have from Varian and Electa with regard to image guidance, like the Varian Edge, the Electa Versa, and so on, that have all kinds of things, right? KV imaging, combium CT, 40 combium CT, trigger imaging, surface place tracking, you can use implanted markers and so on. Here's just a quick example of the, of the OSMS, the Vision RT system, looking to show you how it tracks. There's a threshold that you can use. So if you're beyond the threshold, you turn the radiation off automatically. There's ultrasound-based systems here, like this one from Electa. So with regard to tracking and gating, can reduce normal tissue exposure, for, especially for moving to uh, tumors with large amplitudes. The gating time can be high, two to five times. Implanting for adutials is invasive, so you actually need an invasive procedure for that. You have to be careful, like I mentioned, there's, there can be these phase differences between the external and internal motion. And a nice paper from Martin Murphy back in 2002 showing this, showing you an internal uh, surrogate and uh, the external motion. So in this case, you see a very poor correlation. And here, the external and in internal, very poor correlation between external surrogate and internal tumor motion. So this is something that you have to uh, be careful with. And so the recommendation is, you know, if you can take a volumetric imaging at the start of treatment, that's a very helpful thing. So this is some, an example from David Jeffrey where he showed the value of volumetric imaging. This was a patient that they treated, SBRT lung patient. And so the planning CT on the left, the treatment combium CT on the right. And if you look on the central slice of the combium CT, you see that you do a fairly good job of avoiding the, the heart here, right? This is a high dose region. But if you start scrolling through the combium CT, what they realized was you get to a point where the heart starts folding into this high dose region, right? And so using that information, so it's not just a central slice that you should be looking at. You should be looking at all the slides, slices. Using this information, you can move the heart away, right, from this high dose region. So just the point that the target and surrounding normal tissues don't necessarily move together, and that seeing the normal tissues may be as important as seeing the target. 
All right, so question three, which of the following statements concerning image-guided delivery is false now? A, the treatment time for radiation delivery of a gated treatment is generally higher than that of a free breathing treatment. That's a true statement, right? We're looking for what's false. Surface-based image guidance may sometimes be a poor surrogate for tumor motion. That's true, right? I just showed an example of that where the surface is not correlated to the, the tumor. C, patient alignment using volumetric imaging may help reduce treatment margins. Using volumetric imaging may help reduce treatment margins. That's a true statement. I showed some examples of that. It is important that the strength of the imaging surrogate be considered in the planning margin design. Absolutely, we've been talking about that. And E, daily imaging using planar x-rays gives excellent information on the motion of the tumor in normal tissues. That's clearly incorrect. You can't really tell much because of contrast issues with uh, planar x-rays. You certainly can't tell anything on the motion of the tumor. You can tell about motion of the things like bones and rigid structures, but, but certainly not about the tumor, right? All right, so let's talk briefly. Yeah, question? Shetty? Okay. There was a question about cone beam CT and how there was an understanding that or somebody thought that the cone beam CT kind of acts as a average of the tumor motion in the lung. Um, right. Can you explain more about that or yeah. why it isn't? Let me go back to the picture. So uh, I showed you an example here, and, and that's a, a, a good point, right? So it's a good question. So here's a 3D cone beam CT. So you can see this is the average, right, that you're just talking about, right, the sagittal and coronal views, 3D cone beam CT. This is kind of an average. Now, if you look at a 4D cone beam CT below it, here's the 4D cone beam CT at a peak inhale position. So if you're treating the patient at peak inhale using a 3D cone beam CT, you would clearly get it wrong because your 3D cone beam CT position is very different than your peak inhale position, right? Mm -hmm. Now, but if you look at the 4D cone beam CT at the peak exhale position, you see it's much more, it's much closer. So the peak exhale is a 4D cone beam CT is much closer to the 3D cone beam CT. The reason is, is that the 3D cone beam CT is an average and things tend to average out in the state that acquires most of the time. Well, we know that most of the breathing cycle, 80% is in exhale, right? Right. So, so when you average out, it's averaged out over exhale, which is why it agrees with the peak exhale for 40 cone beam CT. It makes sense? Right, so it, it's more, bias towards the exhale. Correct, because 70 to 80% of the breathing cycle is in exhale. Understood, thank you. Okay, good. So I'm gonna talk now briefly about, in the next you know 10 minutes that we have left here, uh, briefly uh, about MRI, which is a new development, MRI in the treatment room. And there's some new technologies, the view ray technology and the Electra technology called the Unity system. Here's some examples of the view ray machine. You're looking at breast cancer imaging. You can see the contrast is night and day. Here's the lumpectomy cavity. And if you look at the onboard CT, you can't see anything, right? The, the, the cone beam CT. I'll show you an example of a 70 year old female uh, that we had, that we treated with a recurrent small cell lung cancer. Here are the PET images. The physician insisted to treat this patient on the view ray machine because it, we couldn't see anything else on the other machines. And so we went for, this patient had a, uh, a hydronephrosis, me meaning that the, the kidneys weren't functioning and they, they had to use a stent. And so the physician was like, we need to give some relief, so let's use 27 gray in three fractions. So nine gray per fraction. And here's what the motion of this tumor looks like. And you can see the, the inner border is the movement of the tumor and the outer border is the, your, your, your motion envelope. And whenever your tumor is moving outside this envelope, the radiation beam shuts off. So not only are you able to see the normal tissues, you're able to see the tumor, and you're able to shut off the radiation beam when you're outside the tumor. This was a very small boundary. It was two millimeters because of the fact that you had this, this critical bowel structure right above it. And you know if you give nine gray three fractions, you can cause a colostomy or hole in the bowel 
which would be detrimental to the patient. So we, the physician wouldn't be able to treat this tumor on any other machine except for this MR guided machine because of the contrast, great contrast that you get. So if you look at the outcome for this patient, at three months, the, the, entire, the issue resolved, and three months later, and I, the patient was doing great. You know, I think a year later, was, the response was maintained. And you know, the, this type of treatment wouldn't have been possible without real-time visualization of the target and the normal tissues, which is where MRI really helps you. We, we, there's some early clinical results for pancreatic cancer. This was a paper that was published last year, 44 patients with uh, locally advanced or borderline resectable pancreatic cancer. And they divided up the patients into max BED less than 70 gray or max BED greater than 70 gray, which was considered the high dose arm. And the less than 70 gray was a standard dose arm. And in the, the, the high dose arm, 70% of the treatment fractions were adapted to account for anatomical changes whereas only 4% were adapted in the low-dose arm, meaning that in this high-dose arm, every patient every day got a different treatment plan. On this machine, you can do something called adaptive radiotherapy, which you're familiar with, but you're doing it on a daily basis with the patient on the treatment machine. It takes about an hour for each procedure, but it's, it's a very high, it's a technically involved procedure, high-profile type of uh, procedure, but uh, these patients were all getting that. So if you look at the results in the high dose arm, the overall survival 49% versus 30% out to 24 months. And remember, this is locally advanced pancreatic cancer, right? Typically, the, the median survival is six months. But these patients were doing very well. And even if you look at the uh, freedom from local failure, 77% versus 57%. So, and then also, Interestingly, which may be not surprisingly though, the high dose arm had less toxicity than the standard dose arm. So if you look at grade three or more toxicity, for the high dose arm, it was 0%, 15% in the low dose arm. And then again, that might suggest that if you're avoiding the normal tissues every day, you actually won't run into toxicity problems. So this technology led to a multi-institutional phase two trial, safety trial, which is currently open using 10 grade times five fractions. Uh, and there's five institutions. There are over 30 patients treated now. So there's, it's about a third of the way done, I believe. So anyway, just an example of what we can accomplish. So in summary, hypofractionated treatment using SRS or SABER techniques requires high levels of accuracy in simulation, planning, treatment, delivery. Localization accuracy is critical, and the margin design must incorporate systematic and random errors and other factors such as the strength of the surrogate. Remember the Van Herk formalism for computing the planning margin. Advances in technology, planning, and image guided have enabled us to offer very high BEDs to tumors safely, resulting in better outcomes for patients. So I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Chetty. So we, I know you have only a few more minutes. So there's a couple questions. Um, sure. I'll try and go through a little bit quickly. The first question is, do you have experience with <clears throat> Electa's 4D CT symmetry system and in, in, in kind of your experience with that? Electa's 4D Combium CT system? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I, 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 I don't use Electa machines, but I am familiar with that system, and I believe you can use it prospectively during treatment. Do you, are you familiar with any other 4D comb, comb beam CT systems? Well, the variant, yeah, I am familiar with the variant comb beam CT, 4D comb beam CT. Mm -hmm. But the variant solution, you can't apply the change during treatment. You have to retrospectively analyze it and make some retrospective correction. Okay. You can't currently use it in the prospective setting. Okay. And I, and I have a question from your, when you opened the discussion about small field output factors uh -huh. um, and the measurement with the ion chambers, how, what would you consider is the minimum or maximum size ion chamber that should be used for measuring output factors? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you used your standard 812 chambers and, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, blanking on what the volume of that chamber is right now. It's between 0.1 and 0.15 cc or something. Those are the, that type of chamber 
would be used for calibration of, of your Linac at a 10 by 10 field size or something. If a typical calibration, you can use a larger chamber, but for small field chambers, you certainly don't want to use, you know, such a large, you know, you're, you're generally using 0.01 cc chambers or something, you know, order, orders of magnitude less, less than that. But, you know, a 0.12, a 0.1 cc chamber would be reasonable for calibration of the machine. A lot of it depends on field size. And there are many articles out there talking about what types of volume chambers and diameter, length diameter chambers you should be using for different field size. Generally, the cutoff is around three by three. If you want to use anything, if you want to measure dose for anything less than three by three, you want to use a very small volume ion chamber or a diode, right? Stereotactic right. diode, for instance, or the edge diode or something like that. But if you're using if you're measuring things that are above that, then you can use larger fields. You wouldn't want to use a cylindrical farmer, large farmer type chamber. Those, those devices are typically used in diagnostic for calibration, not in radiation oncology anymore, any longer, anyway. Okay. Right. Let's see. And, uh, Dr. Chetty, we have a few questions from uh, the prior sessions that uh, if, if you have a few minutes, we'd like to review. Yeah, I, I just have a few minutes and I, I had to run. Sorry. Okay, great. Well, we have, I believe, John Bersenio on the call. And, and so thank you so much for joining, Dr. Chetty. That was a fantastic lecture. Probably one of the most interactive we've had with questions. And I think you did a great job with your presentation uh, bringing to life great. the slides. Thank you. Was, were there any other questions that you had or anything else? I'm happy to spend a few extra minutes to discuss. I, w I can share my screen very quickly. Uh -huh. Perfect. Yeah. Here was one question that was pertinent. Um, can you see this okay? Yeah. Okay. So the key to conformality of dose around the target uh -huh. is and in the audience, feel free to type in answers. The answer for this one is A, number of non-coplanar and non-opposing beams or beamlets. Do you want me to go ahead and put in a consult to the conference? And I think Dr. Chetty did a nice job of showing how uh, multiple beams are used. Right. We had another question for single fraction SBRT of spine. Mobilization of the patient should be performed such that. And here the answer was actually B. Minimum intrafraction motion is expected. And minimum intrafraction online imaging is necessary. These questions might be on the final exam, so we're just trying to review them for people. And we can do one more. For IMRT, SBRT of lung, minimizing the interplay effect in between target motion and radiation delivery can be best and easiest accomplished by minimizing the target motion using immobilization using gating technique during the exhale phase, adding more margins for tumors that move more than one centimeters, or using appropriate external and internal surrogate markers. What do people think? So the answer for this one is, A, minimizing the target motion using immobilization techniques at the time simulation. And Dr. Chetty, I believe you showed that um, by using these immobilization techniques, it could reduce the margins by about 50%. Although the, the drawback was that sometimes these treatments lasted longer during, due to needing to check on the patient and make sure that they were okay. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, I didn't get into a lot of about immobilization techniques. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. Another technique to reduce interplay is just to 
is actually if you did did use gating you would you would uh, avoid interplay effect because you would be treating at a given phase so that's another option but you know i guess you could argue about which one is is better the immobilization i, I think if you're using an itv based technique clearly reducing the target motion is a key issue so you know in general i would agree with a more than b okay excellent great, great. thanks everyone if there are other questions feel free to reach out ben you know how to reach me great great Take care. thanks everyone thank you very thank much you. Dr. For your yeah time. it was a pleasure pleasure for me to present to you today take care thank you take care Bye. Bye. Gracias a todos que han asistido. Muchísimas gracias. Daniela. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Buenas noches. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye.